Welcome back. Now, you might not know this, but Australia is hosting the first ever in the world behavioural exchange conference. No, I had no idea what it is either, but in the lexicon of business buzz philosophy, nudging is the new thing, apparently. Here to explain all of this and tell us about this conference, the world first, Professor of Public Policy and Academic Dean of Harvard Kennedy School, Professor Iris Bonnet, who is out here for the conference, but right now in our Sydney City studio. Welcome to the show. Welcome to Sydney. Thank you for having me, Janine. My pleasure. Firstly, can you sum up? I've seen that, that uh, my um, reading of this, uh, of the conference, is that Behavioural Insights combines the latest in neuroscience, psychology and behavioural economics. And it's been employed by everyone from the White House to the Singapore and, and the UK governments to help improve policy outcomes. What does that mean in English, Professor Burnett? <laughs> yeah, that sounds rather dramatic. <laughs> um, I mean, what we're trying to do is to learn from how our minds work and use those insights to improve our decision making. And decision making of individuals, consumers, voters, but also of organisations and societies. Okay, so basically how is this done? We've had lots of study of behaviour. What's different about this? Yeah, so sometimes we behavioural economists are referred to as choice architects and I think that's actually a good way to think about this. There's architecture, physical architecture all around us, there's landscaping, there's infrastructure and that influences how we think and the kinds of uh, decisions that we make. Um, in dramatic ways, but we believe that uh, an additional architecture that we have to think about is how choices are presented or framed. Let me give you an example. Uh, for example, you could talk about 90% fat-free products or you could talk about the same products but focusing on the 10% fat that is in the same product. And we know that consumers will respond very, very differently to whether we talk about the fat freeness or the fat content in a product. I can understand where this applies to consumers, perhaps even voters. We've seen a lot of, of study into that. Where do you apply it to helping governments and, and where is it from a management point of view of business and government? That's an excellent question. Um, much of my work actually focuses on managing people. And uh, so an example is to think about how we evaluate our job candidates, how we hire, how we promote. And we've been trying to understand the gender biases that affect our decision making in those kinds of situations. And the nudge that we look at is, for example, whether we hire uh, sequentially, one at a time, or whether we make multiple decisions at the same time, meaning that we hire in batches or as bundles. And it turns out that when people hire in bundles, and this is a, you know, a show on, on, on business, so this will resonate with, your, um, uh, with our uh, viewers here, when we hire in bundles, then people are much more likely to think of this as a portfolio of choices and variety or diversity is much more likely to emerge. I love the term nudge. I've seen it popping up a bit in business jargon. Um, let's take the gender issue. I would argue that nudging hasn't worked. They need a good foot up their behinds and a big shove rather than a nudge. <laughs> so I, I can't say I'm, I'm you know, completely <laughs> against the pushes either. But there is a very interesting counterexample. So, uh, as you probably know, in Europe, and I don't actually know about Australia, but in Europe, the threat of quotas is real. Uh, quotas uh, f to increase gender diversity on corporate boards. And of course, Norway and a number of other countries have already introduced quotas to increase the percent of women on boards to 40%. The UK has chosen a different approach. The UK has focused much more on these behavioral insights or nudges and has been able to increase the percent of women on boards from 11% in 2011 to about 21% uh, today. And their goal is to have 25% women uh, by 2015. I think we're taking more the UK approach and the nudging while it has improved is uh, proving frustrating to some who want more action and are talking quotas. Apart from the gender issue, where else can nudging? Give us another example perhaps for governments yep. or business. Yep. So think about, uh, we just talked about voters before, um, getting voters to vote is obviously one big part of democracy. Oh, well not here because of course you get fined if you don't, we're one of the few compulsory voting. Ah, I didn't know there that. There you go, oh, we don't cool need nudging, you just wave a big fine and it's amazing how many will come out. Uh, um, I'm thinking the fact that the New South Wales government, I did not know this, has set up a behavioural insights unit. Yeah. Um, again, where could we practically see work mm -hmm. in, a, in a state government? Yeah. 
Absolutely. So some of the ongoing work um, really across the world in many different countries and um, including in, in Australia is thinking about tax compliance. So it turns out that if you remind people of what other taxpayers do and how much uh, they pay, then tax compliance increases. Another interesting intervention in terms of tax compliance is the question of when you sign your tax form. And in most countries, and again, I don't know whether this is also mm -hmm. the case in Australia, we sign at the very end. So we complete mm -hmm. our tax That's form right. and we sign at the end. Turns out that uh, laboratory research suggests that if you sign first, people are more likely to uh, fill out the forms honestly because they think of themselves as an honest person. Okay, so if you sign on the first page rather than the late last, you're yeah. thinking, I've already signed this, I better do the right thing. That's exactly right. My ah. identity now is as an honest person. I've just declared that I'm an honest person. Ah. Now I can <laughs> see that as a nudge. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So obviously nudge is going to be this new buzzword. Tell us a bit about the conference in Australia. Why little old Australia having a world first when you've got a whole unit in Harvard on this? It's uh, very interesting. There's enormous enthusiasm for behavioral insights or nudges uh, in Australia and in particular uh, here in Sydney. And uh, I don't know wh why it came to be here, but certainly my sense is uh, Australia might in fact uh, make kind of a leap here and uh, implement, implement a number of the insights that have so far been gained in the UK, the US and Singapore. Uh, but the ent enthusiasm is great. We have 400 people participating in the conference and I, I was told that we had to turn away people. See, now I find this extraordinary because to be honest, where we love jumping on a, you know, buzzword trend business thing bandwagon, mm -hmm. um, you know, be it, I don't know, what was it, blink or whatever, um, mm -hmm. nudge being the new word. Yeah. But I just, as I say, it seems we're not known for our subtlety. This seems, it is quite subtle and it is a, a theory and it just seems an interesting one that's very hard. I mean, you've done a good job of arguing the practicalities of it, but uh, it's an interesting one that people are jumping onto or are people always looking for anything that will give them an edge these days? Well, you know, I don't know. So I think there, this uh, new idea, um, I think it's different from some other ideas in the past and I think the two differences are first of all that it's very evidence-based so equally as important as building uh, on psychological insights is how we examine whether uh, whatever we want to do works so everything is experimental so think of clinical trials so when we want to test a new drug, a cancer treatment or something we typically have a treatment group and a control group we use the very same design to test our interventions. So whenever we test a new way of hiring, a new way of evaluating, a new way of um, designing our tax forms, we always have control groups and we have treatment groups and we uh, measure the difference that difference really makes. And I think that's um, appealing to Australians that this is about understanding what works and what doesn't work and getting um, all of us to make better decisions. Well, I can understand it's been a boon for the academics. You've got a big a lot of them there. But my fear is that those people you're turning away, is this going to be a boon for consultants? This will be the new thing they'll be trying to sell us. I am a, what is it, a behavioral insight expert. You better pay me a fortune. Uh, that might well be true, I don't know. Um, I think the biggest um, a fraction of people in the audience are in fact people, uh, public servants who work in the public sector. There's a number of um, private companies represented, including some uh, consultants, not that many academics. I mean, not, some of us um, uh, on, on the panels obviously are academics, but the audience I think is primarily um, people from all, all over Australia and the, some Singaporeans from the, the public sector. The other thing I find interesting is, as you mentioned, you're doing this in the US, the White House, the Singapore, UK and Australia. So obviously it's not based, there's not a cultural issue here. It's, um, it's, it would be hard for me to predict which countries have adopted it. I mean, the Netherlands is also doing it, the EU, European Union is setting up a behavioral insights unit. So I'm starting to get the feeling that this is um, spreading a across around Across borders, the world. across mm -hmm, borders. Absolutely. Oh, look, I love being first with the new business trend <laughs> and a buzzword. So nudging and behavioral insights. Good luck. I know you've got day two of the conference tomorrow. I expect we'll be hearing a lot more about this. Keep nudging them. Thank you, and thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you. That's Professor Iris Bonnet.